Welcome to Nerds at Church, a podcast about nerdery and the Bible. I'm Pastor Emily, and I use pronouns like they, them, theirs. And I'm Pastor Kay, and my pronouns are she, her. In this episode, we'll discuss the name of Jesus, also known as the presentation of Jesus, which this year falls on the 1st of January, like it always does. We have one content notification for this episode. We discuss names and changing names and the complications arising from that in the deep dive. Check out the episode description for links to the Bible passages and other references we make in this episode. Our deep dive for today is a deep dive into names and naming. So we figured we'd start out with some deep diving into naming in the Bible. There are a lot of different circumstances in the Bible where people have their names changed and are named to begin with. We know that in Jewish tradition, it is common to name a child on the eighth day after their birth, which for those with penises is when they are circumcised. But there's also a tradition in the Bible that we see of people's names being changed, which I think is super awesome, particularly as a trans person. So we see in the very, very beginning, Abram and Sarai become Abraham and Sarah. I think actually you could even go to the very, very almost beginning of the second creation account in Genesis 2, where God creates a human, and the Hebrew is Adam, who comes from Adama, as Dr. Diefelt pointed out in our Advent 4 episode, that Adam comes from Adama, and it's not until after Adam becomes Ish and Isha, which is the Hebrew of what we call Adam and Eve, Yes, that then they get those names. So that's another way of thinking about like that sort of name change that comes even before Abram and Sarai. Then there's also Jacob, who wrestles with the angel of God, and so, well... There's Jacob, who wrestles with the mysterious person who we attribute to being God slash the angel of God. Yes. And so then is named Israel, wrestles with God. That is a name change that Jacob goes by Israel, but then also, like, there are a lot of references to both Jacob and Israel. And so that seems like a name change that sometimes happens where you still go by both names. Just get an additional name. (laughs) like in the lutheran tradition it's often accepted by those of us who go into the pastoral part of the clergy that for some parts of our lives we may just give up our first names like we're we're just pastor now there there is no other name for us that that's particularly predominant in the midwest it's also i think it's also pretty common in latinx communities i've experienced it a fair amount yeah you you don't need a name you're just pastor that's okay You are your role. And then there's, like, the the conversion of Saul, who becomes Paul. That one's a little tricky because I think that's just, like, a difference in the spelling in the languages. Yeah. But we, we have, like, lifted that up as, like, part of Paul's conversion is right. changing the name. So whether And he not, references the helpful. name change a couple of times. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. And then there's also a lot of folks who have not been named. This is hugely women are not named in the Bible. No, really? I know. Weird. But women and gender nonconforming people both kind of get that role. And so there's a tradition in the church of naming those who are not named. So the Ethiopian eunuch actually has a name. And this, I think, comes mostly from the Orthodox Church. Is that right, Kay? Uh, That's where I've seen it arise from yeah yeah so thank you wikipedia yeah right so a lot of that is the orthodox church but also i know especially for the ethiopian eunuch because they are someone who is gender non-conforming there is also a contemporary naming of them with more variety of the names that people give them yeah but to to not be so default into a gender those names are not written in stone yes for example yeah But also, like, the woman who anoints Jesus' feet, the woman who comes to Jesus for healing for her daughter, for healing from her hemorrhages. There are so many different women. So, so many. So many. One of my Hebrew Bible professors in seminary actually would name them Mrs. Noah, right? So Noah's (laughs) spouse was Mrs. Noah because it was in an attempt to give a name. Acknowledge their existence. Yeah. Yeah. 
and he was older, and so like having Mrs. same last name that was, was still progressive. Really, he he really was acknowledging yeah, yeah that 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 was what he was going for. Yeah. yeah. And so we're talking about this whole name thing because, of course, today's gospel is Jesus getting his name. And infants being named can be a complicated or thorny concept for a lot of people in a lot of different situations. Uh, I've personally enjoy reading a lot of online advice columns, and boy howdy, do people <laughs> write into them about their children's names all the flippin' time. So for a long time, in Christianity at least, whatever name the priest said at your baptism was then your name. So usually the way this worked was that you pinned the name you wanted to give your child on a little piece of paper to their clothing and then the priest read it off the piece of paper because depending on how big your congregation was you might not get a chance to meet with the priest beforehand and explain the name mm. and then of course even if you did get that chance please for the love of everything holy write something down if you want your clergy person to say it out loud <laughs> in church <laughs> because otherwise we will forget and say absolutely the wrong thing okay. so on the one hand, that was helpful. On the other hand, depending on your handwriting and the priest's eyesight, this could also go horribly wrong. <laughs> and in the Franny Fisher books, uh, that's how she got her name. Her name was supposed to be something way more common and uh, reasonable. Like, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but maybe Phyllis or was something, say, which Phyllis was pretty common at the time. Yeah. And instead, the priest misread it. And the priest happened to be a scholar of ancient Greek manuscripts. And Franny is a famous ancient Greek courtesan and that's how she wound up with a fairly <laughs> unusual and very specific meaning of a name that's fantastic which it might explain a few things about her personality but <laughs> and that yes. is like the ways that names impact kids and yeah. personalities is fascinating to me and there's absolutely that also ties into the other piece of naming that I forgot to mention that happens in the bible which is when god says this is your name. <laughs> and Yeah, you, you don't get to disagree with God yeah, on that one. That, that doesn't work. It also frequently, yeah. like, is super problematic. So the book of Hosea, which is a complicated book and, like, tons of so content notifications if you want to check it out. But Speaking of people who need therapy. Right. God and Hosea both need therapy. But those... Oh, man, can you imagine being God's therapist? Yikes. <laughs> I... That would be hilarious. But... And depressing. Well, yeah, but God tells Hosea to name his kids with certain names, and actually throughout scripture, especially Hebrew scripture, if you ha if there's a name in Hebrew, it probably means something. So pay yeah, with so like, a lot of names from various languages are like that. If you mm -hmm. name your kids something from that language, it's connected to a real word that means something. Yeah, and that happens still in English, but is less intentionally so. Like biblically, the name was that name because it means something, not because it sounds good. Yes. And for us, I right. think it's like, oh, it sounds good and it has a good meaning or something. Yeah, well, that can vary. Yeah. There is also a lovely bit in one of the Anne of Green Gables books by L.M. Montgomery where Anne talks to her friends about the concept of living to beautify your name. Like, the mm -hmm. reason why we tend to like names or dislike names is often based in the people that we've known that have had that name. Mm -hmm. And she mentions how she used to like one name, but then she met this one person who just really was not nice at all, and therefore now she can't stand it. And she used to not be able to stand another name, but she met this one person who was delightful and now likes it better, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I always kind of liked that thought. But traditions about naming your kids varies. Uh, do you name your kid after a real person? And if so, is it okay to name them after someone who is actually still alive? That mm. varies. Uh, in Jewish tradition, you don't name your kid after someone who's still I alive. I was going to say, that actually, the... it's two different. It depends on your particular tradition Branch. of Judaism. There's oh, okay. one that you don't. You name it after people who have died, and one that you name it after people. You can name it after people who are still alive. Or, like, there's okay. a different way that you name it, and so that person might be alive, but also might not. Yeah. And different families will have certain traditions around names, like there are family names or names that are passed down through generations. Historically, in my family, it used to be the tradition that the eldest son's middle name would be the father's first name. Mm -hmm. uh, and the names were passed down that I way. That uh, my grandfather name. hated his first name, and so he stopped that tradition uh, at my <laughs> dad's generation uh, but my husband's family had the same tradition and he does have his dad's first name as his middle name my dad just has his dad's name as his name yeah 
Yeah, that's also a thing. There's also the tradition of the mother's maiden name. All of this, of course, is like yes, mired in heteronormativity. We are very white people as well, but yes. Yeah, but like my my sibling has my mom's my mom's sure. last name is. Yeah. And speaking of which, um, my mom and her sister were not given middle names when they were children because their parents' idea uh, was that they could use their maiden names as their middle names after they got married, which back in the 50s was actually kind of progressive. Mm -hmm. There is a hilarious story about my mom and the Social Security Administration, which we may or may not get into later, (laughs) about how that actually worked. (laughs) Or didn't, rather. There's also the question of, do you name the kid what you're actually going to call them on a daily basis? Like, say, Tony. I Mm. had a friend of a friend who was named Tony, not Anthony, because that was what his parents were going to call him. Mm. Or do you give your kid a more formal version of their name that they can then adapt and like mess with a little bit later? Which is why my parents gave me the full name of Catherine, and I've been both Katie and Kay over the years to different people. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. My personal favorite question, which I just fundamentally do not understand, possibly because I was a Catherine in an era of that name being hugely popular, (laughs) and therefore being in a room with half a dozen people with my name was not at all unusual. There's the question of, is it possible to steal a baby name? If your cousin names their kid something, does that mean that you're not allowed to use that name? What if it's your sibling who names their kid that, you know? I actually have that dilemma because my cousin named one of her kids one of the names that I have always really wanted to name a kid. So I've thought about it and I'm like, no, you know what? It's okay if there are two of that name. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, Especially if they're like not, you know, born minutes apart and living a couple of blocks from each other. Yeah. At this stage in the game, they're going to be at least like a decade apart probably. Yeah. Uh, And... All of these various quandaries have led to uh, the standard rule that I that most of my friends have embraced, uh, which is that you only tell people your child's name after the kid has mm-hmm. been born and while they're looking at a picture of the baby. Yeah. And they are way less likely to argue with you <laughs> if you do it that way. Yep. And they're less likely to plant the seeds of doubt that make you yes. like question your choices about your kid. Absolutely. And also, I've known quite a few people who uh, already were doing at least some of that. There have been a lot of traditions where you don't say your kid's name out loud until after they're born, you know, alive, because superstition, and Mm -hmm. you don't want to jinx the kid's health. Yeah. Also, so my mom was grew up Catholic. And in Catholicism, you get a saint's name. Oh, yes. Saint's name. And so she did have a middle name. Her middle name was Ellen, but her saint's name was Elizabeth, and that became my middle name. So I'm Emily Elizabeth. And while it's fun to pretend like I was named after the kid in the Clifford books, that is not actually accurate. I came along (laughs) before them. But that was... Also, you're not really a pet person, but... You know, I have a feeling a dog is in my future soon, so... Okay. Yeah. But yeah, so it's it's a like I know that's also part of it for some folks who are Catholic. Also, the dog will probably not be you know really enormous and bright red. Yeah, not bright red for sure, and not bigger than me for <laughs> sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. And also, I will not be the primary caregiver. Yeah. At the end. So the other piece about naming is renaming. So one of the most obvious examples for me is trans people who choose new names. There are a lot of trans Mm -hmm. people who keep the names that they have. That's where I'm at right now in my stage of life. Probably forever, but who knows? And other people do change their names. A lot of people, particularly who identify more as a binary trans person, will change their names, but a lot of non-binary people change their names too, because a lot of us have been given names that are very, very gendered, and so can that can cause that can just be a problematic thing to always be called something that makes you feel weird about your gender and yourself. Anyway, so some people do and some people don't, and it is very important to support those who do and those who don't. And if they do change their names, if anybody changes their names, and this is something that I, when I was in high school, did absolutely terribly at when somebody I knew changed their name, and I was like, no, I like this, like, I know you as this name, I don't understand why you're changing your name. It doesn't make sense to me. No. 
uh, I have since come around, obviously, because that's <laughs> really terrible to do to somebody. Yeah. But it's important. And we're talking about renaming specifically around trans people right now. But literally, there is no reason that you cannot change your name or rename yourself. Anne of Green Gables, right? Well, she picks money. Okay. But like, that's a le- from a legal perspective. Yes. Right. But like, if you're if you don't have money and or and or don't want to deal with the legal stuff, you can change your name. But yes. like Anne of Green Gables, she spent I remember I didn't read the books, so I only watched the Netflix series. But I remember when she first got there, right? She had to figure out what she wanted her middle name to be. And so then she like figured it out and became Anne Shirley. What's her last name? Well, in the books it stays Shirley. I think in one of the TV shows she does legally take on Cuthbert as her last name. But in the books she's always Anne Shirley. Oh, in the- I I think the the Netflix version may have added something. In the Netflix she becomes but- she chooses Shirley as a middle name, and so then she becomes Anne Shirley Cuthbert when she sure. writes it in their family Bible. Yeah. So anybody can change their name if they want to. You don't have to be trans to change your name. If you don't like your name, you should change it. But yes. And lots of people do. Yep. But, and a lot of people do also connect it to adoption, which is an interesting thing that I think we're going to get into more later. Yeah. But there's... Also, a lot of great resources for supporting people and for, like, tips and tricks on supporting people. If someone you know does change their name, the best thing to do is to practice and intentionally use their name as much as you possibly can so that you get their new name into your head. And just make sure you have it right before you start practicing or else you may have an entirely different set of problems. Yes. And make sure you know where they want to use that name because for a lot of people it's a slow yeah. progress of using new names and new pronouns so make sure you know what circumstances it's okay to use which name for people yeah also this is one of the opportunities that churches have to celebrate and support people it would be yeah. a gift to a congregation to be able to celebrate and support in worship someone who is changing their name and Friend of the podcast, River Needham, actually has a couple liturgies. One is a baptismal affirmation, I believe, and one is a service of communion that she created that we'll link to in the episode descriptions that specifically are for doing a naming right in the context of worship. Um, So that is a wonderful gift that she has contributed to the world. Also, some advice from our other friend of the podcast and co-host of Horror Nerds at Church is it's from Pace, who is going through a name change process legally and said just to tell the audience, if you weren't planning already, that name change is a pain in the ass that feels purposefully designed, like much of trans legal and medical processes designed to obfuscate and make it hard or impossible to access desired services. So, uh, As Pace said, it is really hard. It is complicated. It is not built. The name change process is not built for trans people. No. It is slightly easier than a lot of gender changes, but legal gender changes, but it depends a lot on the place you are, where your birth certificate is, if you have the documents, and mainly if you have the money and the time to do it. There are some people that will do pro bono work, but it's hard to find. And as a person who has gone through the process of changing my surname at marriage, and, you know, as a member of the group for whom that process was first designed for in the United (laughs) States, and therefore uh, I was told by a number of people, oh, don't worry, they streamlined it. Like, apparently, at least in Minnesota in particular, uh, the process is a lot easier here than it is in a lot of other places. Mm. I don't know how true that is. I've only ever changed my name in Minnesota. Although, you know, certainly with state and federal authorities. But agreed, that was a mess. Also, like doing that right after you have put together a enormous event with a lot of your beloved friends and family. And while you're still completely exhausted from that, not the world's greatest timing. (laughs) Yep. And that's right. Like it is particularly because it is made to be easier for name changes connected to marriage. And so then when that's for women, for changing women, their changing their last, their last names, names for, for marriage, yeah, for, for heterosexual marriage. Yeah. 
years and years ago, my mom, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, was not given a middle name by her parents so that she could take her maiden name as her, as her middle name and keep that with her for the rest of her life. Mom did that at her first marriage, uh, who was not my dad, and was told by various people that, yeah, that's fine. There's a particular form that you have to fill out in this particular state, which was Illinois, uh, in order to do that at that time and place, in which was in the 70s, which is apparently no longer the case. Uh, but there was a particular form for keeping your maiden name as your middle name. You had to fill out something extra. And apparently she did that and everything was fine. Cut to 50 years later. She has now been married to her third husband, also not my dad. My dad was number two. <laughs> and she moves from Illinois to New Mexico, and she goes to New Mexico when she turns 65, or a couple of months before she turns 65. Uh, she goes to the Social Security Administration there to start filling out the paperwork for receiving Social Security. Mm -hmm. At which point they tell her that she has not been using her correct legal name for the last 50 years. Oh. <laughs> well, it wouldn't have been 50 years. It, it would have been say, like real young. 40, 45 years. But yes, it turns out that there was like a typo or something in that one special form she filled out. And so therefore, legally speaking, according to the federal government, she had not had a middle name for the last 45 years. Oh. And she was supposed to just be going by her first name and whatever her husband's last names were. Mm. So now they have that fixed and now she can get her social security. But she found out that what she thought was her name was not actually her name for quite a while there. And that was awkward. Although that also brings into the, like calls into question the idea of like what counts as your real middle, as your real name, right? Like her real yeah, name was absolutely. the name she was going by and legally, no, but like, right. where do we put the power and who has the authority? That's fascinating. Yeah, but like I, you know, when I got married, I dropped my maiden name and I kept my middle name. And so now it's first name, middle name, my husband's last name, mm -hmm. which is so much easier to spell. Uh -huh. I cannot even begin to tell you. My mom, but... my mom hyphenated when she got married. So she yeah. And then she's just dropped it after the divorce. Yeah. I had a number of people suggest that to me. And my next story about names and changing them is that my great grandfather, patriarchal great grandfather, changed the family surname, which was my maiden name, on orders of the American government to make it more American so that he could join the Navy and fight the Germans in World War One, mm -hmm. because our last name was German. The original last name was von Bolenbacher, mm -hmm. which is absolutely quite German. Mm -hmm. He changed it to make it less German to Bolenbach. That is still super German, you enormous dorks. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> that is the family story of why that side of the family does not trust American bureaucracy just on general <laughs> principle because they do not have good judgment. Sorry, no, this name is not any more American or less German than the other one was. Yeah, And so... Hyphenating Bullenbach with literally anything would have just made my brain explode, and I wasn't going to go there. Yeah. But. Whereas I love that I have the initials E E E, and so we'll probably always yes. keep my names as they are. Yeah. Except now, of course, you're Reverend E E E, so it's you're. True. <laughs> it is true. It's true. And on an even lighter note, there's always the endless argument about what are the proper names for people versus what are the proper names for pets. Mm. I went with the traditional clergy people having biblical names for their pets, but then also gave her a shorter name. So my cat is Magdalena, but called Maggie on a daily basis. Mm. Uh, but there are also people who do not believe in giving people like names to animals and therefore always name their animals Spot. Something, yes, uh, Spot or Fizbin or whatever. and Or Jean and Jorts, uh, who have recently become famous on Twitter. Th they're a pair of cats in an office. I'll, I'll send you the oh. thing. It's freaking hilarious. I have heard of Jorts and was like, I have no idea who this Jorts is. That makes more sense. Yeah. Also, there are some people who name them after other literary characters. So I know somebody oh, who sure. has like a Tonks and a Sirius. <laughs> the one thing that I have heard is that you should not name, especially dogs, a name that starts with N or N and O because then they will confuse their name with the word no and it'll be really hard for them to follow instructions. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the one like naming advice that I was like, huh, all right. 
that works. I, I think the one useful naming advice for pets that I ever heard was, if you have an animal that goes outside, do not name them anything that you would be ashamed to scream at the top of your <laughs> voice, possibly in the middle of the night across your neighbor's yards. True, true. Our first reading for this episode is from Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. God instructs Moses on how Aaron and his family should bless the people of God, creating the ironic blessing. Not to be confused with the ironic blessing. <laughs> I'm actually going there in the... Oh, good, because I was like, I don't know what that would be. But I was thinking about this and thinking about this blessing and then thinking about, like, who blesses people. <laughs> and now I have the image in my head of, like, Aaron as Glinda the Good Witch. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> and does that make Moses Elphaba? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. And since we have recently cast Moses as Samuel L. Jackson, that makes Samuel L. Jackson Elphaba. <laughs> I'm so happy to. Oh my gosh, that would be such a fun rendition. Yes. No good deed goes unpunished, mother. <laughs> I was thinking more of the original Wizard of Oz, but also, yeah, Wicked would work yes. as well. Absolutely. In verse 23, we read, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the Israelites, you shall say to them. Please keep in mind that this is the ironic blessing, as in the blessing given to Aaron, mm -hmm. not the ironic blessing, mm -hmm. which would presumably come to us through Alanis Morissette, or, I suppose, the Aaronic blessing, which would presumably come from Ireland, <laughs> Aaron being another name for Ireland. Mm -hmm. Although if it came through Alanis Morissette, we probably would have a completely unironic, ironic blessing. I'm not getting into that grammar argument today. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. And then in verse 25, we read, The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Uh, and like many Christian clergy, I love this blessing, and I love giving this blessing to people at the end of services and so on. But also, I find myself often wanting to add, but not so much as to give you a migraine after the first part of this verse. <laughs> uh, because given how Moses reacted to God's face shining on him at Mount Sinai, we know that being seriously photosensitive afterwards is very possible. Mm -hmm. uh, Moses had to wear like a veil for uh, a while. Uh, and I recently started reading the web comic A Girl and Her Fed, which is definitely for grown-ups. Her Fed? Uh, and yes, uh, as in federal agent. Mm, okay. uh, there's also a super intelligent koala and the ghost of Benjamin Franklin. I would say that it makes more sense in context, but sort of, I guess so. Um, it's very fun. And ha being very photosensitive to the point of migraines uh, it is shown as not a fun thing to have to live with, even if you do have a super powerful computer chip implanted in your brain. I believe that, having had maybe a migraine yesterday. Yeah, Oops. right? Is not so fun. Not so funsies. I also was looking at that verse and the verse after, and the way that I read it was, the becoming one make their face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The becoming one lift up their face upon you and give you peace. And in the NRSV, the word for face in verse 26 is countenance, but it's literally the same word in Hebrew for each of those. Yeah. Which is fun. But then it started making me think of God as the, depending on your culture, rabbit, toad, frog, lady, or man in the moon. Yeah. I was like thinking about it. I was like, well, I don't want God to be the man in the moon. I was like, but there's a culture that has like the rabbit in the moon. There's actually a variety of cultures throughout the world who traditionally have a rabbit in the moon. And we'll link to an article that I found on that. But I really... Or the cheese. You know, none of the options were cheese. But the man apparently comes from Germany, so we can sure. thank your ancestors. <laughs> I, I think the cheese, the, the moon being made of cheese thing was a running joke in early silent films. Uh, it shows up a couple of times. But. That makes sense as a source. Yeah. So, But I really like that, and it reminded me of Barbara Brown Taylor's Learning to Walk in the Dark. So I like this idea of God as the moon instead of as, like, the sun where there's like a full solar spirituality where everything has to be good all the time and you get like a couple weeks of exception every once in a while if it's a really bad thing. But otherwise, you just got to be good. and You got to be fine and you can't be depressed. Whereas like God as moon is there's waves and titles and growing and wean waxing and waning. Yeah, I really like that. Sure. Also, Christianity already has a sun. Huh? 
It's true. And then in in verse 27, we read, So they shall put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. And I love that idea of that being, of the ironic blessing, as being the way to put God's name on the Israelites. And it's a great way to incorporate this blessing into a naming rite if you're doing a, na- a service where there's a naming rite or a ritual to do the whole thing to be make their face shine upon you and put the person's name there. And so then it's putting God's name on that person in particular, which I think is super awesome. Sure. And then our first second reading for this episode, which is to say our second reading for this episode, but there are two epistle options for the day, is Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. As God came to us as one of us, fully human and fully divine, we have truly become God's heirs through adoption. So one of the themes for this passage is adoption, obviously. It's in the summary. And this is just... Partly just a shout out that adoption is complicated. Yes. And people who are adopted have a lot of different perspectives and thoughts and feelings about it. And those deserve to be respected. Absolutely. And one of the things that I feel like the author of Galatians is trying to get at in using adoption language is this idea of being chosen intentionally. That God has intentionally chosen us as followers of Christ. And it reminded me of the way that the Fellowship of the Ring chose to join together in Lord of the Rings to destroy the ring. That they chose to do it for a variety of different reasons. And some people felt more or less obligated to do it, and more or less there's no one else who could possibly do this without me. And some a little bit wanting, you know, glory for their own community. But they all chose to go together into this community. And that's a lot of how we talk about baptism is an intentional choosing on God's part of the baptized and of bringing people into communion. And in verse 4a, we read, but when the fullness of time had come. Now, I loved reading the Phantom Tollbooth when I was younger, and that book shows a world that illustrates wordplay. I love wordplay, Uh, but I did not read Phantom Tollbooth. I might have to read it as an adult. It is a fun book, and I know there was also a, a movie adaptation, uh, which was pretty good. I, I definitely liked it. Uh, and I would love to see what fullness of time <laughs> would look like in the Phantom Tollbooth world. Like, since in that world, uh, half-baked ideas come from an actual bakery, and also <laughs> if you eat them, they make you a little sick. Then who is inflating time, and with what? And, like, is it becoming a bouncy castle or a mattress or what uh, to make it sold? I was thinking pouring liquid into it. Ooh, that works, too. Sure. Okay. Now I'm curious, though. What? Yeah. I nominate you to write in and ask. <laughs> uh, well, I think the guy who wrote Phantom Tollbooth is dead, so that'll involve a Ouija board. <sighs> but Well, not the worst way to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> that is a weird thing to choose to go on the record with that, but okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Like, what is the worst way to communicate? <laughs> like, passenger pigeons after they've gone extinct? Oh, I was thinking, like, yelling at someone and not letting them talk at all. But also, passenger pigeons would also work. Yeah, Throwing dead animals at each other? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I also looked at verse 4, but I looked at the second half of verse 4 where we read, Born of a woman, born under the law. So, here's my perennial PSA. Not everyone is born of a woman. Don't be a turf. People who are not women can give birth, and not all women can give birth. Also, yay women! I always have to name the, like, yay women, because women always have to be named explicitly, because the default is to assume that they are not there unless they are named specifically, even though in most languages that are patriarchal, like Greek and English, and a bunch of others, the masculine form is used as the, like, default but I always like when there's woman is specifically named, and it always reminds me of my favorite quote from Lord of the Rings, which is when the ring wraith says, no man can kill me, and Eowyn pulls off her helmet and says, I am no man, and kills him. Yes. Beautiful. Also, in Macbeth, it is claimed that Macbeth was not born of woman because he was delivered via cesarean section. Then I am not born. And so woman. not born, technically. Oh, so then I have not been born. Uh, That's by weird. By Shakespeare's I, rules. I don't like Shakespeare's rules. That was assuming that born meant, you know, the whole labor process. Vaginal and so birth, on. yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. 
my sibling was it my mom was in labor with my sibling for like 40 hours and then it was a c-section so was that birth or not birth because it was labor but not vaginal birth according to Macbeth. i i think according to shakespeare it, it was vaginal birth versus i mean because in that mm-hmm. time if you did a cesarean section the mom didn't usually live uh, so gotcha that's you know yeah complicated anyway <laughs> That was a weird side. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Sorry. And then in verse six, we read, and because you are children, God has sent the spirit of her son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Papa. So this made me think of the spirit of children. And since I moved my three and three quarters year old at this point, who I love and who loves me, we don't see each other all the time. And so now we see each other on like videos or like she'll say mama I want to talk I want to text Emily and so then she'll take her mom's phone and text gibberish and anytime gibberish comes from her mom's phone and I respond and I'm like hi how are you and when we do video calls and stuff like the she just like has this way of just being like she gets so excited about people like interacting with her through technology which is kind of weird but yeah so that's that's what I'm thinking of of the like spirit of children in this But I also just watched the Ewok special, Caravan of Courage, which is, in my opinion, not a holiday movie, though it is apparently a controversially designated holiday movie because it came out during holiday times. And the younger child, the younger human child in this is Sindel, and she, when they finally get reconnected with their parents, she is similar to what I think of of Spirit of Children, that she just, like, runs up to them and is, like, hugs and love and care. Yeah. Yeah, I read verse 6, and, you know, if God is literally talking to God's self through us, that might explain why some parts of the faith remain mysteries to us. It's kind of hard to think straight when someone else is talking through your own brain, I would have to imagine. (laughs) Uh, And... We can only listen to so many voices at once, which is why we now have the wonderful gif of Idris Elba f- from Pacific Rim saying, you, shut up, you, keep talking, because he only wanted to listen to one person at a time. Ah, uh, gotcha. So God, maybe if you weren't talking to us at the same time as everyone else, we would be able to listen a little better, mm. just saying. And for this lectionary date, we do have an alternate reading for the second reading, which is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. The Christ hymn acknowledges that God gave up much in order to truly become human in Jesus Christ, so that all of creation would come to praise God. So one of the themes in this passage is the idea of the power of a name. In this Christ hymn, the power of the name is that it causes knees to bend. It causes people to praise. And so it just, like, struck me as a very, very contrasted, like, a stark contrast between the power of Jesus' name, which is one of, like, that promotes ideally, adoration and praise and love, and the power of a certain Voldy's name, which promotes fear and terror and pain and sorrow. And one yeah. of them is encouraged to be said, and the other one is discouraged, which I think augments how different they are, that Jesus' name becomes more that, because we're encouraged to, t- to say Jesus' name, we're encouraged to talk about Jesus, and the as, depending on which movie book whatever you're saying depends on who said it but fear of a name only encourages fear of the thing itself and so when we're not afraid to talk about jesus then we're also likely to not be afraid of jesus yeah so that's don't fair make jesus Voldy. although if voldemort knew whenever someone said his name now i'm wondering if god knows whenever someone says god's mm. name i mean they only knew it i mean because but if god like knows it. everything then yeah i mean god probably does just because god Yes. But does it catch God's attention? Or yeah. does that happen so often that God doesn't really notice anymore? Or hmm. That's a good question, because Voldy on, only knew because they set up a like spell yeah. and stuff, spell. so it would have, like, probably Voldemort didn't even know, because he's not going to be in the ministry keeping track of that thing. But, hmm. yeah. When we read verse 5, we read, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. I would like to take a moment to remind you all that a mind and a brain are very different things. Don't forget. (laughs) Although now I am wondering if Jesus's brain would also be labeled Abby Normal if kept in a jar like the one from Young Frankenstein. Thank you, Mel Brooks. It's a it's a running bit in the movie. It 
turns out that the brain that the guy grabbed, he, he was supposed to grab the brain of like a, a saint who was also super intelligent or something. And instead he, he broke that one. And so he grabbed another brain that was named um, Abby Normal. Abnormal. <laughs> That's fantastic. I gotcha. I'm catching yeah. on. Sure. And then in the second half of verse seven, we read being born in human likeness and being found in human form. And so, of course, my natural inclination is to go, okay, so Jesus is the doctor? <laughs> the next incarnation of the doctor should be in Ood form. Ooh, Absolutely. That would be cool. <laughs> but yeah, the doctor, because the doctor takes on human likeness and takes and has human yep. form, but is human, except that Jesus is fully human. Mostly human form. Well, yeah, except for Aside the Aside from hearts. the two hearts and the <laughs> various other things, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then in verse 10, we read, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And I don't know why we don't hear this verse more often as an argument for universal salvation, because if under the earth is a intentional reference to the concept of hell, which in the New Testament, I guess I just assume that that's what it's trying to reference. If you believe in the concept of hell at all, which not all Christians do or have to. But if everyone in hell is busy kneeling at Jesus's name in the time after the last judgment, then they're not going to have a lot of time to, you know, torture people or whatever it is that they supposedly do. All of which is basically made up according to Dante's Bible fan fiction, also known the as Inferno, The Inferno. Which is actually a good uh, and. It, yes, it's it. it's a good book. It's not the Bible. No. <laughs> Does not actually match up at all with what the Bible describes as the afterlife, but that's a whole different, you know, podcast episode or eight. So Yeah. But yeah, if hell also turned into, you know, the great hellish chorus, I guess, of people praising <laughs> God, then would it still like be unpleasant? Mm. You know, I don't know. Good question. Yeah. And I read uh, verse after verse 11 and read and every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god and so then I, I was like okay but is this like every tongue like the organ that is in a mouth or every tongue like every language because every person confessing this is much more problematic especially given christianity's history and present of colonization sure but at having every language have someone in it who confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord is actually like kind of a cool thing, but also still yeah. kind of problematic. Or if you're talking about tongue as just the word tongue, that would mean that also all lace up shoes would confess <laughs> Jesus as Lord. Now right? I just want to see everybody's shoes confess Jesus Christ <laughs> is Lord. <laughs> Like, if, if you're going to translate into the English language, you really have to be careful, I'm saying. That's all. <laughs> like, man, you thought translation was difficult before you met me. <laughs> Our gospel reading for this episode is Luke chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. The shepherds go and share the good news of Jesus' birth. And eight days after Jesus is born, he is named and circumcised. So one of the themes in this passage is birth announcements. Both the angelic birth announcement, which prompts the shepherds to come but also the birth announcement that happens in the naming and in the circumcision and what is important about them and what I love about these birth announcements are that nobody is asking what genitalia the child has right that's true absolutely and it's I mean they're not even like asking how many fingers and toes the kid has but it is that this child has been born and how amazing this kid is and what a gift this kid will be from God. And I think it would be great if all birth announcements happened that way. Also, my other PSA, don't do a gender reveal. It's a horrid thing. And no, you'll just wind up setting all your friends on fire. Yeah, you'll set your friends on fire. You'll also, you know, probably be wrong because that's how God works. Yes, yeah. God has a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't trigger it. Mm -hmm. I would also throw out there that if you know people who are currently freaking out about whether or not their baby's birth announcement is awesome enough, just remind them they can't measure up to Jesus's birth <laughs> announcement. They will not have a heavenly chorus show up and uh, announce their baby's birth in the middle of the night to all of their friends and family. So or since it's never going to be that awesome, just relax. Yeah, yeah you'll be fine. Be good. <laughs> and speaking of 
shepherds. In verse 15, we read, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which God has made known to us. And as I was thinking about the shepherds, we don't, there are a lot of equivalents of shepherds. I think today I might say undocumented farm workers or meatpacking plant sure. workers. But in the Expanse show, which just started its final season, so I am have been diving back into it, I actually think the shepherds would have been like the belters. So the folks who end up, there's folks who are earthers, there's folks who are Martians, folks that live on Luna are also with Earth. And then there's the belters, the folks who live in the asteroid belt and do a lot of the like manual labor and hard labor for earthers and for martians sure so the shepherds kind of fit in that like doing lots of hard labor and not getting a break as much i suppose the people on the moon probably don't want to be known as mooners that would <laughs> I think not they, be what they were going i think for. they do talk about the moon as luna so i don't know well l- lunars would be fine mooners would maybe imply some other things. <laughs> yes I misheard you. Yeah, probably yeah. not Mooners. That'd be weird. And then in verse 17, we read, When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. So they're telling Mary and Joseph what the angels had said about Jesus. I'm really hoping this isn't a case of mansplaining. <laughs> like, do they really think that Mary and Joseph are unaware? And in which case, what does that say about their understanding of God? Mm. Like, that would be kind of rude on God's part. Or are they just so overexcited that they're, you know, excitedly babbling and telling them everything they've ever heard? Kind of like Hermione in Harry Potter does all the time. Mm. I was think That would be Yeah, better. I was thinking about it more as a, like sharing in all of the like things because they don't know that anybody else has been told or what Possibly. they've been told they just know like a group sure. of angels nobody else had a whole choir of the heavenly armies showing up for them True. Sure. so sure. yeah i thought it was just like the excitement thing but that is a good yeah. especially given the like mary did you know controversy that comes up every year yeah uh, yes she knew do you know where god keeps god's armies where in his sleeves Oh That's oh, my stepdad's favorite terrible. joke. Terrible. <laughs> well done. Do you know what it's called when someone's afraid of Santa? No. Claustrophobic. Ow. It was in a terrible Christmas movie that I watched. And then in verse 19 we read, But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. This, Mary's treasuring and pondering happens multiple times and happens in the passage that immediately follows this one when they encounter Simeon and Anna. But I love this because Mary is so much like Her Excellency Christian Avasarala, the Secretary General of the United Nations in Expanse, where she just like, she's not always that in but right now she is. But in her whole career, she's always paying attention to everything, every detail, picking stuff up, even when it pierces her own soul, even when it is like gut wrenching for her. She's still gathering and trying to figure out how to protect her people and keep people safe. And then in verse 21, we read, After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So one year, I was helping at a vacation Bible school, which is basically a week of Bible camp uh, for kids. And a teacher was asked by one of the kids, why did they name him Jesus? And the teacher's answer was, because the angel said so. Which remains one of my favorite stories of how to answer a kid's question (laughs) in Sunday school to this day. Because if an angel tells you to name a kid something, then you do that. (laughs) Right, Zachariah? (laughs) I'm just saying. I mean, Deborah, I that was seems like, pretty reasonable. Concerned about the possibilities of it more than the name of it, but yes. Yes, no, but but Zechariah ended up agreeing about the it's name. True. It's true. Like it, it was the existence of the yeah. baby that that Zechariah didn't agree with. But you know, agreeing with angels is usually a good plan, right, Zechariah? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, yeah. As you say that, I think it's worth mentioning that our scripture, when we read the New Testament, is translated from greek in and sometimes aramaic but mostly greek into english there there was also a time that it was translated from greek to latin and then to english but so the name 
because the Bible needed to be more complicated. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Catholics. You know. Yeah. But so the name Jesus and the name Mary even, actually, like, that's probably not what Jesus was actually called. He was probably called Yeshua, because that makes sense yeah. in the context of, like, what they say the name means. And Mary was probably Miriam, closer to Miriam. Yeah. And both of those names have really important meanings in Hebrew and Jewish culture. Right. But we've apparently run with the Jesus part of Greek. It's the anglicized version. Yeah. The anglicized think, yeah. version of the Greek, Greco-Roman version of the Hebrew. Yes, probably. <laughs> Which reminds me, I did recently comment that I think it would be awesome to have a, an ancient Hebrew translation of the Magnificat mm -hmm. because Mary's language is so forceful and vivid and the Hebrew language is really good at that and I would be fascinated to see how it was translated into the language she might have been speaking at the time. Ooh, yeah, but. that would be really cool. I'd be down for it. Thanks for joining us. Catch us next time when we'll discuss nerdery connections to the scripture readings for the second Sunday of Christmas. This podcast has been produced by us, Kay Roloff and Emily Ewing. For more fun, check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Nerds at Church, or contact us at nerdsatchurch at gmail.com. Also, if you like what you've heard, rate us or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you catch your podcasts. If you want access to our uncut guest episodes and interviews, live Q&As, and more, Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerdsatchurch. As the ancient Christian said, Pox, Pox Phobiscum. Phobiscum.